afternoon to everyone. My name is John McDermott and I work for the Institute for Human Development in Flagstaff, Arizona. We are a University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. We're located at Northern Arizona University's campus. Um, please come visit us at uh, nau.edu. You can search for IHD or you could tap it to, uh, put into your browser avertac.org to see Avertac's site. Um, I want to remind everyone that this is a listen-only webinar. If you have any questions or comments, please utilize uh, the chat pod, and that is in the middle lower part of your screen. Um, you'll see at some of the pods, uh, you'll see an icon with four arrows, and this will allow you to go to full screen mode on your device or computer for that particular pod. Um, and also, if you look at the lower right of your screen, you'll see a file share pod. Um, these are files that you can download for reference. Um, if you have any questions, please contact us at ihd at nau.edu. And finally, we'll be recording the webinar today to archive on our Avertac YouTube channel. Um, that being said, we want to welcome you to the introduction to Assistive Technology Foundations for American Indian Vocational Rehabilitation Counselors webinar um, brought to you by IHD and Avertac. Um, this is the first of a sequence of events uh, we'll see our first webinar, then we'll go to a community of practice, and then we'll follow it up with our second follow-up webinar. Um, then that will serve as a final look at the topic. Uh, today's presenter is Janice Dineski nicole and I'm going to take this opportunity to switch off my mic and switch on her mic, and we'll do an audio check there. Hold on one moment. All right, good morning and welcome to the Assistive Technology Center at the Institute for Human Development. We're located in uh, Flagstaff, Arizona on the Northern Arizona University campus. And I am excited to start sharing some information with you with this introduction webinar and also looking forward to doing a community of practice, a follow-up webinar, and then some online modules about assistive technology. And we're also available to take any questions um, that you may have in the near future regarding assistive technology. So today's an introduction to assistive technology, um, really geared for uh, vocational rehabilitation staff. And I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I am a speech language pathologist and assistive technology practitioner. I've worked in the field of assistive technology for about 20 years, and my interest areas and my practice areas are communication, language, and literacy, but also applying those concepts to um, vocational settings, work settings, and home environments. So today, our goal is that American Indian Vocational Rehabilitation Service Administrators, counselors, staff, and consumers, if there's any consumers with us today, will consider assistive technology as a potential key to successful vocational outcomes for persons with disabilities. And we're gonna do just a quick poll of two questions here. And so the first question is, do you consider assistive technology when meeting with clients uh, or consumers? So that's our first question there. And you see a poll up there. And we don't know who's answering these questions. We're just curious. Do you feel comfortable with this concept? We've got a few answers there. It looks like everyone is starting to consider assistive technology, which is wonderful. And then we can um, switch over to the second poll there. And the second poll says, do you find a need for training in assistive technology and how to successfully embed assistive technology into the vocational rehabilitation process? Well, there's some overwhelming votes, yes, that there is a need for this training and how to um, embed assistive technology into the full vocational rehabilitation process. So, and I'm assuming many of you are answering yes, are here today to start learning about this. And so today we'll give you a real good introduction. And then as we go forward, we'll give you more in-depth training on how to do those parts and pieces. 
Okay, we can close down that poll. All right. Okay, so just a quick overview of what we would like you to know at the end of this presentation. The first piece is what is assistive technology? The second piece, what are assistive technology services? Number three there is how does the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 as amended impact the provision of assistive technology for vocational rehabilitation consumers? And then why should assistive technology be considered using the quality indicators of assistive technology, vocational rehabilitation? We'll be introducing you to that concept today. Now we'll also look at what are the major categories of assistive technologies that are used in vocational rehabilitation setting. And we'll conclude today with some examples of assistive technology tools which may be used in vocational settings. So we'll start with a real good definition of assistive technology. And a lot of times we'll simply say AT. Um, and assistive technology has a very broad definition. Any item, piece of equipment, or product system, whether acquired commercially off the shelf, modified or customized, that is used to increase, maintain, or improve functional capabilities of individuals with disabilities. So what is assistive technology? And that definition is fairly clear. Assistive technology is any item. So as you had done your poll a little bit earlier, I saw a lot of votes saying, yes, highlighters are assistive technology. And absolutely, we can highlight text to draw someone's attention to it, to increase their ability to read that text. We also look at smartphones and the many, many applications that can assist an individual with a disability. Um, there were a couple of questions on maybe a pencil and graph paper are or are not assistive technology, but graph paper often helps someone to form letters within the compounds of the graph paper, and that's actually an adaptive pencil there. The black dots have some bumps on it to increase the ability to hold on to that tool. And then glasses were another one I think I saw that some people thought they were not assistive technology, but those are another AT tool, as is a calculator, and are the many, many different uh, keyboards and mice and adaptations we can do to computers. So great job, though, on that early poll as you were entering this learning event. Okay, so let's take a shift over from assistive technology tools because what we do know about the tools is just any tool that increases the ability of an individual with a disability. And we also need to make sure if we're providing assistive technology tools that we're also providing assistive technology services. And our law simply states that any service that directly assists an individual with a disability in the selection, acquisition, or use of an assistive technology device. So this might be an evaluation. It might be acquisition of products. It might be assistance in selecting the correct product. It might be a process of designing the most appropriate product or repairing tools. We know that assistive technology and our technology that we use every day is not perfect. Um, also, we need to fabricate something. And we need to do a lot of coordination of services and training. So any of those pieces are considered assistive technology services, which could be a part of an individual's IPE. We also need to make sure. OK, and just so all of you know, it is 1 o'clock AM on my talking clock. I have a number of assistive technology tools set up. And if you heard that in the background, we might hear that one going off a few times today. But let's go back to informed choice here. We need to make sure that as we're discussing assistive technology with consumers, that it's an informed choice process. We want to make sure that consumers consider um, desired services. That might be an evaluation. That might be different tools and strategies that they may or may not want to use. May include specific follow-up services for tools that were recommended. So we need to make sure that we're in allowing our consumers to work with vocational rehabilitation staff, individuals who are doing evaluations, so that they can make an informed choice on what tools and strategies that they may want to move forward with. And we're going to 
to do a quick shift over here. I'd like to show you some assistive technology in action. And this, this is a series of photographs and videos of one of my consumers who was exploring computer access to increase, maintain, and improve functioning. And so this first picture here shows um, this consumer. He's positioned in a power wheelchair. He drives his power wheelchair with a joystick there. Um, he has a tilt and recline chair so that throughout the day he can change his position. And this specific consumer has ALS and he's currently pursuing going back to work and possibly um, finishing up his master's degree. And we also look at assistive technology as lots of tools that we may design or fabricate. And this is just an excellent example. You see this um, board here. And in the middle of that board is a smartphone that's mounted. So it won't move around on the board. And this consumer can slide his hand across the board onto his phone and be able to access his phone. He doesn't have a lot of hand movement, but he can slide his hands back and forth. And so fabrication of this piece was an excellent solution for him. Um, this consumer, he also uses voice control. And we'll see some video of him doing a variety of different activities on the computer in a moment. But you can see he's wearing a headset with the mic there. And he's got his computer positioned in front of him and is controlling the computer, typing emails, typing letters, anything that he needs to do on the computer with his voice. And this is a picture, you'll notice that we've added a piece of assistive technology to this consumer. On the rim of his glasses above his nose there is a metallic dot. And we'll show you in a moment how he used the metallic dot to control his computer. And that dot took over as the mouse for the computer. And whoops, I went too far ahead of there. Um, so we're just going to shift over for a moment to the actual video of this consumer. And I am going to voice over this video and talk you through what you're seeing. Okay, we did do a trial of a number of different mice for this consumer. Whoops, it looks like we may have lost that video. But you can see here, this is a video of the consumer using a mouse. That bar that he's accessing is an actual mouse. And we're going to move on to the next one. This is the consumer using that head mouse. Again, a metallic dot on his glasses. And you can see he's got an on-screen computer keyboard there. And that white movement is him moving his head to the specific letters and actually typing into a Word document. And you can see that camera up at the top there. Okay. And then the final trial of assistive technology that we did with this consumer is eye gaze. And so those two white dots there that you can see are him getting ready to use eye gaze. And he will be looking again at that computer keyboard down at the bottom and typing into a Word document just by using eye movement. Go ahead to the next one. Okay, and this is the consumer in a final video here. He is using eye gaze to, again, type there. The eye gaze bar is at the bottom of that computer there, and it's recognizing his eye movement so that he can control the computer. We can watch through that one more time. That's OK. All right. We're going to, there we go. And the, or the computer system that he's using there is a Toby eye gaze system. And this is a consumer that is ready to go back to work and wants to pursue a career and independent living. And we're gonna support that process. We're gonna switch back over to our slides here. Just take some moment to do a quick switch into our PowerPoint slides again, and here they are. Okay. And we're gonna go forward one slide here. So, I gave you some information about what is assistive technology, what are the services, 
we just watch a consumer using some different types of assistive technology through an evaluation process and some clips of him doing that. But now let's switch over to why are we considering assistive technology within vocational rehabilitation? And the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, as amended, or the Act, is one of the strongest pieces of legislation that we do follow, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we move on. But we also look at different policies that address assistive technology, and they can be found in different legislative categories, including civil rights law, the Americans with Disabilities Act, Education law, especially for our students who are transitioning into vocational rehabilitation, we look at the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, and then also technology law or the Telecommunications Act, which ensures that telecommunications equipment is accessible to all individuals with disabilities. So going back to the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, Truly, the act was the foundation for the role of assistive technology in modern VR. It protected the rights of individuals with disabilities and allowed them to participate in programs and activities which were receiving any federal funding. And through the act, we also look at the reasonable accommodations to bring someone back to work or to transition someone into a work setting. With the 2014 amendment of the act, we're also looking at that Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, and we're going to see increased services to youth with disabilities. My hope is that we'll see better transition from high schools to colleges and to workplaces with the appropriate assistive technology. We're going to support employer engagement and engaging employers also in conversations about assistive technology. We want to ensure competitive employment. We want to enhance accountability for many, many different parties, including the provision of assistive technology and accountability in that area. We want to promote collaboration and efficiency, and assistive technology, again, fits very well into that component. And finally, with the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, we look at training and technical assistance, such as the training that we're doing here, specific to the American Indian Vocational Rehabilitation Services. Let's talk a little bit about some of the importance of AT for VR consumers. You all felt that you were considering assistive technology for VR consumers in our earlier poll, but you also indicated that there's a need. There's an absolute need to learn more about assistive technology. So let me give you some foundations of why we want to make sure we're doing that consideration. And then we know a lot about assistive technology tools that are available and those services. And first and foremost, we want to decrease the denial of workplace and educational participation. We want consumers to be able to access the workplace and all educational environments. We also want to make sure that we're minimizing barriers. And on this screen, I have a brilliant photo. It's a set of stairs. And at the bottom of that set of stairs, is a wheelchair. And that's a very, very obvious barrier for many of us. But there are many, many other barriers that we can decrease through assistive technology. We also want to do some improvement of high school graduation rates, post-secondary enrollment, and employment status. And here on this slide, you'll see that the post-secondary graduation rates for American Indian students with disabilities is 11.5% as compared to students in general with disabilities, which is 24.4%. We need to level these playing fields and significantly increase both of those rates. And assistive technology can be one step forward in that area. We also want to expand rehabilitation options through jobs and career potential. 
that takes careful analysis. And I think many of you indicated that we're starting that step. We're considering assistive technology. I would assume that many of you are also attempting to understand the many functional limitations of the consumers you're working with. And then you're also, I'm hoping, starting to use some of the cost-effective reasonable accommodations that you have available to you. I would assume for many of you that includes computers, some assistive technology tools, different tools that are available off the shelf in stores, and also different strategies. But through the many trainings that I'm going to be providing over the next few months, I'm hoping that I can give you many, many other cost-effective and reasonable accommodations to consider. So I always like to be able to use a process that I can follow to consider assistive technology. And one of the processes that I followed for many years is called a QUIET, the Quality Indicators of Assistive Technology. And the QUIET was developed with school districts in mind, with preschool through high school and transition considered, and really applied just to those school systems. A number of years ago, though, a group developed the QUIET VR, and you can see that web link there. And the QUIET VR was to develop to support vocational rehabilitation programs to consider assistive technology from initial consideration all the way through application of assistive technology for individual consumers. And so I'd like to introduce you to a few of the pieces of the QUIET VR and know that as we are developing training modules, we'll go more in depth into the QUIET VR and you can select different models to review and understand this QUIET VR even more in depth. And we'll look at consideration, assessment, inter including AT in the IPE, implementation, evaluation of effectiveness of assistive technology, assistive technology and transition, and that's not only transition from high school into vocational rehabilitation settings, that may also be transitioning into a new workplace. We'll also consider administrative support of assistive technology and professional development and training in assistive technology. Finally, we want to make sure that we're supporting consumer self-awareness and self-advocacy specific to assistive technology. Most important for today is really continuing to do what you're doing. As you indicated, you're considering assistive technology. And here's a few guidelines to think about as you continue to do this work day to day. Consideration includes AT devices and services, which are considered for all consumers. Consideration, which is collaborative and systematic. We're going to work with you over time, hopefully, to provide some of that systematic decision-making process. We also want to make sure that VR staff has knowledge and skill to make informed AT decisions and to seek assistance when needed. And if you have a specific um, assistance need, you can absolutely contact AverTech and more information is on our website on how to contact us and make requests in that area. We also want to make sure through considerations that decisions are made based on the consumer's IP and that goals and objectives, environments, and situations are considered as we're choosing assistive technology. We want to make sure we're analyzing data to support our AT decisions. And we also want to make sure the range of assistive technology is explored. And we often talk about um, the Cadillac of assistive technology, the most expensive tool, is not always the most appropriate tool. Sometimes we can use low-tech, lower-cost assistive technology and meet the exact same needs. Okay. Last piece here, why consider assistive technology? And that's because we are reporting program evaluation data in vocational rehabilitation programs. And with individuals with an employment outcome, we are looking at annual program costs per participant, employment retention, and average weekly earnings. And each one of those bullet items there 
can potentially be increased through considering an assistive technology tool or strategy. And so we're going to, in just a couple of minutes, do a transition to some light tech and mid tech assistive technology tools. But before we do that, I could not bring every assistive technology tool into this training. So I want to start as we talk about assistive technology categories and assistive technology tools to talk about one of the most important considerations in the field, and that is seating and positioning. And oftentimes, we don't think about seating and positioning first. Rather, we think about what is the best keyboard for someone with a physical disability. If we start with the keyboard and the consumer is not well positioned at a desk or in the most appropriate chair or wheelchair, then that keyboard and use of that keyboard won't go as well as we want it to. So as you're considering assistive technology for all consumers, consider that 90, 90, 90 degree sitting angles there in that first picture. Um, we want to be comfortable and sit at those 90 degree angles with that computer screen in front of us, our hands naturally positioned on a keyboard and our feet well supported. We also may want to consider if someone's working all day long at a computer, can we provide them opportunities to do sitting at some times, but also using that same desk, doing a standing position. And there are crank adjustable desks and there are electric desks and many accessories that we can put on desks to transition to those different positions. There's also many different office chairs that can be used and then many different positioning pieces that can be added on to current wheelchair systems. The other thing I did not bring today, <laughs> I didn't bring my van uh, with my accessibility options. I didn't bring a power wheelchair. I did not bring a, a white cane. And so these are the pictures that I'd like you to look at on the slide. And mobility and transportation aids are a category of assistive technology that absolutely need to be considered for all consumers. One of the biggest barriers to employment can be transportation to an employment site. And the modification of vehicles so that an individual can drive or that so an individual can be driven to a work environment, a school environment, truly needs to be considered. Um, also considering the options for public transportation that may or may not be available in many of our rural areas. We also need to consider the types of wheelchairs and scooters and mobility systems that are available to consumers. This picture is an excellent example of a power wheelchair in the middle of a grass field. We need to consider the locations that our consumers need to get to and desire to get to and make sure that the mobility devices that are selected have access for those environments. And lastly, for individuals who are blind or visually impaired, we need to consider transportation options. And we also need to consider orientation and mobility. And when we talk about orientation and mobility, I'm referring to training and knowledge and being able to navigate through the wide variety of environments independently. And there are many, many systems available to support that. Um, I have pictured here a white cane, but another consideration that is available are sonar type devices because the white cane absolutely provides us with information on what is in front of our walking path. But what about sonar devices to tell us what might be right in front of our face? For example, a tree branch. So there's many, many different assistive technology tools that can assure that individuals have access to that environment. And it looks like we had some picture issues. John, does there need to go back a slide or are we good? Um, I think the slide in question was the ergonomic one. Ergonomic. I can go back one slide just for a moment. 
And then we absolutely can provide um, these slides. They are available as the download. It's the intro to AT um, PDF there, and you can download those, and all the pictures are available in that slide. Okay. I see someone typing, so I'll give them a moment here. And we're just about to transition to an actual um, display of assistive technology. And I will tell you the focus of these assistive technology tools that we're going to transition to are on the lighter tech, lower tech, and mid tech range. And as we continue our trainings and meeting with each other, we can show a variety of different tools upon request of any participants. So I'm going to give John a moment to transition cameras here, and I'm going to transition over to the tables, and we'll be back with you in just one moment. All right, and John's giving me a head nod and saying we are on and ready to go. So I'm going to start with communication, and communication is a significant piece of everything we do every day. And many times we will work with consumers who are unable to use speech as their primary mode of communication. And so here I have just a basic letter board for communication. So if you are meeting with a consumer who is literate, and needs to communicate with you, but does not have a mode of communication. Oftentimes, consumers will not have the option to sign. Um, they may not have those skills, but we can use a simple letter board to um, spell. Or for example, this is a quick message. Hello, my name is John. Thank you. Please stop that. Quick messages. And then the ability to spell back here. And these are great tools to have available. Um, for staff to pull out of a toolkit of assistive technology. And this one we've done in blue to support vision, but we've also done it in a red color also to support different vision needs. We can make many, many different light tech communication boards, but we also do look at some of the higher tech communication systems. And this is a Toby communication system. Here in the center, we have a wide variety of different systems available. This system simply works by typing. Let's see how talented I am doing this upside down here. I'm simply going to type hello. H. H. P. Hell. Hell. And we're going to get our O there. Hello. And it speaks the text that I spelled. We can also use a wide variety of different picture symbols. The features of this system are quite advanced. This is actually an eye gaze communication device. So simply looking at the letter I want to type, I would be able to spell the word hello, speak it, and put any message I needed there. We also have um, transitioned into a world of mobile devices. Um, this is an example of an iPad uh, here, and you'll all know my password here. It's real simple, one, two, three, four. Um, and up on this iPad, I have another text-to-speech communication system. And this one, again, will use a keyboard here to spell messages. But then up at the top here, we see a wide variety of words so that we can quickly create messages just by using individual words. Um, and we can just click on a few of these to see how that works. And then this one also has speech output of my rather jumbled message here. You got every my. OK, so you can see how that one works. And we automatically delete that message. So these are just a few options for communication. Android devices, smartphones, all of those systems also have communication options on them. So I'm going to transition here. We're going to transition over to some different assistive technology for computer access. And again, I just have a few different items to take a look at here. 
There are so many different um, computer mice or joystick options. This is an example of a joystick that someone's hand can rest on and move the joystick from side to side. We also have larger buttons to click. We can also do alternative buttons to click. They don't have to use these exact buttons. One of my favorite mice here is a thumb mouse. The click of my mouse is here. I have additional buttons here. And I can just rest with this in my hand and roll that ball there. I also have a mouse that you can position comfortably in your hand. And there's a wide variety of different mice similar to this. And we often refer to this as a trackball type of system. A few keyboard ideas. This is a one-handed keyboard. One-handed keyboards can be purchased for both left hand or right hand. And through codes of keys, you shift from one side of the computer keyboard to the other side of the computer keyboard, but only have to use this small set of letters. We also have a wide set of large print keyboards and large size keyboards. You can see this one, we've got the black on the white there. We also have another keyboard that has white letters on the black keys. So we have lots of different options for increasing visual contrast there. And this keyboard is very large also. That one down there. And my last keyboard that I have out for today, this is just a mini keyboard. There's not actually any tactile feedback here. This keyboard might be used by someone who's using a mouth pointer or a head pointer to type with. There's a small range in which they're needing to access keys. Okay, And I also, just to kind of transition into the new technology and resources that we're using, I put an iPad out here with a standard keyboard. Many times, if an individual is looking for the ability to do basic email, using the internet, um, typing basic documents, we can select from a wide variety of mobile technology and many, many different applications to support access to these tools. There's excellent access for vision impairment um, and for physical and mobility impairments. Um, with the many, many mobile devices that we have. And I hope to spend some time with many of you showing you different features as we go forward. And I'm gonna transition from some ideas for computer access over to our activities of daily living. And I have a number of resources out here. Again, these are some of the lower tech quick things that many of you may be able to do almost immediately and discuss these tools with consumers. Um, Getting up in the morning, taking medications is often a routine for a lot of us. This is one example of being able to organize medications. We've got first day, second day, or Sunday, Monday. We've also got Braille there. And we've got a great color contrast with this tool so that someone who has low vision may be able to access this a bit better. It's got larger um, openings there so we can open it easily. So that is one option to consider. Um, my handy dandy toothbrush, which has been in my office for many years, but oftentimes someone can't hold on to an item, whether it's a toothbrush, whether it's a hairbrush, whether it's a, a hair dryer. So this is a cup that allows someone to simply place the cup on their hand. They don't have to hold it with a grip. So these options can support many different activities of daily living. How about doing things one-handed? And this is just an example of nail clippers and an emery board that allows someone who is unable to hold an emery board or unable to hold the nail clippers to complete grooming in the morning, getting ready for work. But this actually attaches onto the counter and has one-handed access there. Bathing, showering, being able to be more independent in those settings. This is an example of a bath mitt. If someone can't hold on to a washcloth, they can put this bath mitt on so it can be applied to it and they can bathe independently and this can tighten onto the wrist there. Getting dressed in the morning is a big part. 
of getting ready for work, going to school. So we look at different options that can support dressing. This is an example of a one-handed buttoner. And you can see that the button tool actually pulls the button through the hole. So if you were wearing this model shirt here, you would grab the button and pull it through the hole with this one-handed buttoner and then just slide this tool off. This tool is also made to allow somebody to pull up a zipper with a bigger um, grip, being able to hold on to it rather than holding that very, very small zipper that many of us see in clothing. So let's transition over a little bit to, we're still talking about activities of daily living, but what about cooking and eating? And there are wide sets of assistive technology tools for a variety of different disabilities that can meet many needs. Um, we're looking at forks. This is a weighted fork example. And sometimes just having a heavier tool can assist with holding that tool and using that tool. And then here we have a rocking knife. This is a knife blade at the bottom there. And then to cut an item one-handed, you can hold that blade and rock back and forth. So there's different options for cutting and eating. I have this system here that is attached onto our table. This is actually a vegetable peeler. Someone who cannot hold the vegetable and at the same time peel the vegetable could use this device attached to their kitchen counter so that they can peel whatever they need to peel for an evening meal. We also have a rolling pot holder here. Oftentimes, somebody needs to take a, a very, very hot pot off of a stove, and this is a great location to put that pot and then be able to roll this tool across the kitchen counter. Um, often burns do happen um, with cooking and we want to make sure that someone who doesn't have the physical ability to pick up the pot, transfer it, move it, might be able to roll it across the counter to a second location. We want to make sure that individuals who are positioned in wheelchairs and are cooking are not putting things like this onto their laps. So this is one example. And then there's many other tray systems that can go on a wheelchair um, to support transporting pots and hot cooking items. We also have a blue tool here. This guy right here is called a piece of Dyson. And Dyson is one of those handy, handy tools to have everywhere. Um, Dyson, and I'm pushing on this Dyson right here, keeps things very, very stable and secure on the table. For example, this bowl here is not going to move or slide while I'm moving food around on my plate. I also have a couple of examples here of scissors. Whoops. We've got scissors, which I can simply slide across a piece of paper rather than having to cut. We can do a quick demonstration of how that works. This one will slide across the paper and cut as it goes. We're not going to cut too much in my textbook here. And then we have another option for scissors. These are fiskers. This is a blade option that I can push the blade out there. And I can roll the blade onto fabrics and materials that I need to cut. Again, it eliminates having to do that cutting action with the hand and can decrease the physical uh, stress that someone may have from holding scissors and using those tools. And then one of my favorite pieces here, I couldn't have not shown this one, is a gardening tool. Again, holding on to tools and using a variety of tools can be very difficult. So here you see how this clasps up into the wrist here. You could put some more supports if you needed it or straps in here. You've got something to hold on to for force and then the ability to do gardening, um, planting, etc. Okay, I think we're going to switch slides up to our next section here. Oops. Oh, we're looking for learning. That's okay.
We might have a slight slide issue, but that's okay. I'm gonna, we'll keep going here. And this next section that I'd like to show you is more specific to learning education for our consumers or transitioning out of high school, possibly into college setting, learning setting. We need resources and tools for learning. And again, I have just a small set of some things that you can almost implement immediately. And one of the first pieces I have to show you here is color. And simply changing color and of text. So we can do yellow, not my favorite. We can do a peach or a reddish color there. And you can see that blue. But simply by changing the color of text, we can often change the ability of an individual to decode text and also to comprehend that text. And for children in elementary, middle, and high school, we're actually seeing shifts in grade level reading. I do not have the current research for adults, but we know that it absolutely does change um, the ability to access printed materials. Um, again, for reading, we also want to think about whether we need to enlarge text. We can enlarge our books. Um, we can use magnifiers. This magnifier has the red line to put under the text I'm reading so that I can scroll down as I go there as I'm reading through. And then I also have another example of being able to highlight an individual line of text and also change the color and read as I'm going there. few other things to consider. There's many different writing tools as well as many different papers. We probably have about 40 different writing utensils. This is one example of a pen and being able to hold and grip that pen with less force, less grip there. And then this one right here is the writing bird where I simply rest my hand on that surface got my pen all set and I can write this way. And let's see, I can do a quick signature there. Um, this is a very comfortable position to rest a hand on for someone who may not be able to hold a pen or a pencil. Transition over to another concept. A lot of times, whether we're in a work meeting or we're needing to take notes in various settings, we may have difficult time keeping up with that note taking process. So I wanted to show you something that I did earlier and we'll cross our fingers here that our technology will work. Um, I wrote this text here. It says, welcome to the Assistive Technology Center. And this pen, it's called an echo, will actually play my voice or my lecture from the moment I wrote that exact word. So I'm gonna show you how that works. So there you heard the word center coming out of my pen. But if I wanted to know what I was saying when I wrote the word welcome. Welcome. And if I wanted to hear what I said when I was at assistive technology. Assistive technology. I'm going to turn that guy off here. But the benefit of this is we often have consumers record meetings with tape recorders or audio recording devices, and then they need to listen to the full recording uh, as they're going back through and listening. This case, we can click or touch our pen on the word that we want to hear the lecture from at that point or the meeting from at that point. So echo pens are a great tool and option for meetings and for classes. Um, we also have a uh, talking calculator. Seven times seven equal 40 times. Um, this calculator has got a little bit of a larger layout, nice contrast, but it's also a talking calculator. We also have a wide variety of different calculating tools, whether you need to just do uh, money, whether you're doing advanced sciences. But many of the calculators now, their touch windows or their touch screens there are going to provide us with ways to lay out problems and to do math problems. Many of them are talking. Um, we also started using some of the voice input calculators, calculators where you simply give it the information and it's going to calculate for you. One other mathematic piece here. 
Um, measurement, rulers, someone who is visually impaired, someone who is blind who needs to be able to measure, we can do simple modifications. This ruler was modified with three lines for each inch and then a half mark, and then the next inch is three lines. So someone can determine what length something needs to be that they're measuring. And I thought I'd do one quick demonstration here using the iPad. Um, again, that concept of learning, reading, writing, math, but here is an example. Good morning and welcome to the Assistive Technology Center. And so you heard my voice. I was speaking to my iPad in a free application called Dragon Dictate. And it says, good morning and welcome to the Assistive Technology Center. It instantly translated my speech into text. Um, the only glitch with the one that I just demonstrated is while it is an excellent free tool, it does require internet access um, to get that voice recognition. So I'm going to transition into a different assistive technology category, which is environmental controls. And I just have a couple of tools out today. And I'll give you an example. I'm sorry. I I think a lot of us may not do well without our electronics and our television and our music. So I wanted to show you a concept of a modified environmental control unit. This is for a television and can also control music and any of those infrared uh, devices that people may have in their home. So it's got the large print, the large buttons, but it also supports on this side some alternative access here. So each of these ports would allow somebody to plug in a switch, similar to a light switch, and that switch can be positioned anywhere the individual needs it, for example, under their foot. And then by pushing that foot at their, pushing the switch at their foot, they would be able to activate a function of this device. For example, turning volumes up or turning volumes down. When we talk about environmental control units, we also look at how are we going to control lights? How are we going to open doors and things like that? And so I have a very, very basic example here. This is a um, remote control, which is connected here to my light. I can push the on button and turn it on and the off button here. You should turn off, there we go. So this is a simple adaptation for someone who may be able to push the buttons on this remote control, but maybe not reach their light switches or the small switches where they might be located on different devices. This is often found um, with Christmas lights each year in some of our larger stores because people buy these to turn their Christmas lights on and off. They don't want to go outside in the cold, um, but we've just adapted it to turn on lights in homes um, to turn on different devices also. And we're going to conclude with some assistive technology for hearing and some assistive technology for vision. And I have a few items to uh, kind of talk about ways to do modifications for someone who might have a hearing impairment or for someone who may be deaf. One of the options that we have for someone who's hearing impaired is we can increase volumes. So this is an example of an inline amplifier that can go on a standard house phone. And I can turn it down or I can turn it up. That's increasing the volume of my headset here by just plugging this device in. So that's one option. We can make things louder. Um, another option for someone who has a hearing impairment or stuff is using vibration. And so I have one of my favorite tools here, um, which is called a Shake Awake. It's connected here to my clock. And this vibration is intended to wake somebody up, make sure we get to school and work in the morning. And this is just shaking. It's not volume. There we go. This is one of my favorite tools for students and the university. And when we teach courses in here, everybody likes to try this one. Um, so we've got increased volume. We've got vibration, but we can also do flashing lights. So this is just an example here of a system that can be hooked up to a phone. When the phone rings, this light would flash, 
And then someone typically would use either a TTY or a CapTel system, and we can get into those systems more in the near future, um, to be able to communicate via phone. And then we also have a variety of systems that can feed sound directly from a piece of equipment into a personal headset. So this is an example of a television system. We plug this guy here into our television audio output. It remotely transmits the sound to this headset. So we have lots of devices that serve that function. We can have a speaker speaking into a microphone, and that sound can go to a personal headset or to someone's ear hearing aids. Um, the purpose here is so that we don't have to turn the television volume up to an excessive noise. We can have it at a regular volume comfort level for everybody, and then the individual can adjust the volume on their headset. It also gets rid of a lot of background noise. Okay, transition to our last section here, and we're looks like we're running on time, and we're doing pretty good here. And I just have a few assistive technology tools out that you might consider um, for someone who's visually impaired or blind. We have a large, large set of magnifiers. Um, we usually will refer someone to a low vision specialist if there is a vision impairment that is affecting their ability to read, to write, to work. Um, so this is one example. Here's another example of a handheld magnifier that can be in the purse. Um, quick and inexpensive tools. But we want to make sure that a low vision specialist works with this individual to select the most appropriate low vision tools and the type of magnification. We also have the concept of a large print check and deposit book here. And then this extremely expensive tool here, the biggest marker that I could find, is another thing to think about. When we write notes to people, write letters to people who have vision impairment, if we can use a very large point uh, marker to increase their access to that visual information, that is very, very helpful. So something to think about that you can almost do immediately there. We also have a wide variety of what we call CCTVs. And this is an example of a very, very portable CCTV. This guy actually packs down into a small case. It's got the magnification here and lighting here. That's shining on to my piece of paper. And this device can hook into any um, output. For example, a computer screen or a television. I don't have this hooked up at the moment, but what you would see on your computer screen or your television is this material on that screen, and you can adjust how that material is shown. You can change the size. You can even change the contrast. For example, right now you're seeing black text on white. These systems can change that contrast to white text on black. So lots of options as far as CCTVs, portable systems to enlarge text. And just a few more pieces here. We heard our talking uh, clock earlier in our presentation. And that is not accurate here, but um, we use lots of different systems to talk. This is an example of a clock. We have watches. We have thermometers. We have all types of different devices with speech output to support someone with a visual impairment. I did put out different colored glasses can also assist someone with low vision or a vision impairment. We're also seeing some interesting uh, results using colored glasses for migraines. So just thought I'd throw that in there. Um, here are some braille labels with print on them also. These braille labels can be sewn on to clothing. So an individual knows the color of their clothing. Um, it's always nice to have two tan socks that match in the morning. And I think my last piece that I have sitting here, I think maybe I'll pause and give people a moment to think about what this might be. 
Let's see. Something goes here. And something goes here. And pushing this button down threads this piece here. Any guesses on what this might be? You can type in a guess as we transition back into um, our PowerPoint. And I think my audio is on there, John. Just one moment, so we have real clear audio. We're transitioning back and forth. So, tables of tools back to our presentation. Here we go. All right. So, excellent. It is a needle threader. So, imagine if someone is visually impaired or blind, um, that tool guides the process of threading a needle. Um, it's actually an excellent tool for someone who may also have fine motor difficulties to thread a needle. So thank you for your feedback there. And I have just a few minutes left here and I just wanted to leave you with two solid pieces of information. Um, the first piece of information is the JAM or the Job Accommodation Network. And this is an excellent, excellent resource for all vocational rehabilitation staff to know about and to be able to access. Through their SOAR, the search engine that they have, you can search a specific job or a specific disability or a barrier and a wide variety of assistive technology tools or just technology tools or strategies will be provided to you. This is a great tool to use with consumers um, as you're considering different job opportunities and what modifications or accommodations need to be made. So great resource to leave you with um, to move forward with as you're considering assistive technology. And then the second resource that I'd like to leave you with is information about the Association of Tech Act programs. And across the United States in each state, there are tech act programs, and these programs provide assistive technology information and referral, assistive technology demonstrations, assistive technology loans, and in many cases, um, financial loan opportunities for assistive technology, as well as recycling and reuse programs for assistive technology. So these are great, great pieces to have and add to your toolkit. And this is our last slide here. And I wanted to just remind you that this webinar is a first webinar in a series. We are repeating this webinar. If there's anyone that like to recommend this webinar to others or join us again, we'll be repeating this webinar on Friday. And then next week, we are doing a live community of practice. I invite all of you to please join us during our community of practice. I will be live here answering questions about assistive technology, clarifying information, providing you with resources. If you want to see specific products, I can absolutely do that live um, in the community of practice. Then we follow our community of practice with a final webinar. And that final webinar is generated from questions asked during the community of practice, maybe things um, that you want to see as far as tools that I don't have during the community of practice, I will definitely have by our next webinar. And I can open it up for a few questions. There's one question here from Donna. Um, and I just want to ask Donna, are you talking about the intro to AT PDF in the files? I can explain that.
And if we're having trouble with downloading or printing any of those documents, we can absolutely email them directly to you. That's not a concern. Those can go out to everybody that was registered for the webinar. No problem, Donna. Um, if you go to the files pod in the lower right, what you'll find is that you can click on each one of those uh, uh, titles and then um, uh, the lower download files will highlight and it'll download right in, right onto your PC. If you're having difficulty doing that, uh, you can put your email in the chat box or you can contact us. I will put um, IHD's email in the chat. Uh, you can contact us there, and I'll send you it via email. Okay. And if there's any other questions, I'm more than happy to take them. But I am really looking forward to meeting everybody again at the Community of Practice next week. Thanks, Donna. We have a couple of people typing. Oh, Amanda, I'm sorry that you missed some of it, but please feel free to join us on Friday. That would be great. Okay, and the question is, how do we go into the archive for this webinar? Um, this will be archived onto our YouTube channel, and that a link to that will be available at the avertech.org website. And, and also, case. you'll be receiving a thank you email um, uh, within 24 hours, and then I'll place the link inside there as well for people to archive. Um, and then right now, I'm going to uh, try to link uh, the registration for Friday's webinar right in the chat area. So if uh, people missed part of it today, they can use this link and go sign up for Friday's if they like to. Okay, well, I don't see anyone else typing at this moment in time. Um, again, we're available um, via email and information to contact us is available at avertech.org. And just let us know if you have questions. And I hope to talk to you all next week. Thank you very much. Thank you.